This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Today's lecture is entitled Mexico Today, Changing Cities in the 21st Century. The future of Mexico will be played out in its cities, where about three quarters of the nation's 115 million inhabitants live. Many critical national policy concerns in Mexico are urban, how to manage one of the world's largest megacities, Mexico City along with the rapidly transforming and complex northern border cities. Our speaker today is Lawrence Herzog. Larry is a professor of city planning at San Diego State University and has been a visiting professor in urban studies and planning at UCSD for the last two decades. He's widely published and has been a visiting scholar or professor of urban design and planning in Brazil. Mexico, Peru, Spain, the Netherlands, France, and the UK. He received his PhD from Syracuse University. Please join me in welcoming Larry Herzog today to OSHA. Good morning. Thanks for the nice introduction, Steve. Um, when Steve mentioned that the U.S.-Mexico Studies Center has been here for 30 years, I suddenly realized that I was here when it started. Uh, so I'm not that much older than most of you. In fact, you might, some of you might be younger than me. I'm not sure. It's a little scary. Uh, so I, uh, I was asked to uh, come to speak here. Uh, as you may know, there's a big conference uh, that will occur at UCSD soon called Mexico Moving Forward. So uh, it seems that there's a lot of interest in the question of what will happen to Mexico uh, the rest of the 21st century. I know Mexico's been in the news a lot lately uh, in some areas uh, that I'm not going to talk about today. But I did want to start my uh, talk this morning by reflecting for a moment on, uh, on the past, if I might, and on uh, the question of memory. I wrote a book uh, published in 1998 by Johns Hopkins University Press called From Aztec to High Tech. And in that book, I asked the question, we who live in the United States, especially those of us who live near the frontier, near the border with Mexico, many of you I'm sure have been down to the border, we look across the border and what do we see? What does uh, the, the, the vision of Mexico that we see from uh, the border into Mexico, the cities that we see at the border, what do they teach us and what can we understand about our future when we begin to come together, these two cultures that meet at this international boundary? Um, so I called the book From Aztec to High Tech because I believe that uh, Mexico has an incredible historic tradition that goes all the way back to uh, centuries ago building uh, ceremonial cities, monumental cities, beautiful works of architecture, uh, very well thought out, very inspiring places that are still, in many cases, there for us to see and learn from. And that uh, I thought it was important for us as Americans not to stereotype Mexico, because the news in the 90s after NAFTA was signed in 93 was that uh, when it comes to cities, Mexican cities are flawed. They're polluted, they have a lot of air pollution, and they have a lot of environmental problems, and they're overrun and overwhelmed by millions of rural migrants who are heading to the cities and then heading into the United States across the border uh, from Mexico. Uh, and that, that stereotype of Mexico seemed to me to be somewhat limited. And so I argued in this book, let's step back. Let's take a, a step back. Let's pause. And let's really look at what Mexico is, what its culture consists of, what we can learn from Mexico, 
And I discovered uh, in the book, and I shared with the readers, that Mexico teaches us many things. They've been building cities for centuries, way before we even became a nation. They were, they were engaged in the act of urban design and city building. And that is what I teach, and that is what my research has been about for the last 30 years. Um, and I, I believe that Mexico, Mexican urbanism, if I can use that term, which is sort of the science of city building, is infused with great lessons about the relationship between bu the built environment and the natural environment. Lessons about great gathering spaces and how to design great public meeting places, the great plazas of Mexico that were built not only in the colonial period but also before that. Uh, we can learn a great deal if we look in Mexican urbanism about the role of art and muralism in urban landscapes. There's so much about Mexican cities, if you really look at them carefully, about the way people live in them, the way people occupy space, the way people meet each other in public places, the way they use streets and plazas, the role of gardens, the role of open spaces, uh, the uh, role of what a design of a building should look like and how it should relate to the surrounding neighborhood, the purpose of public buildings uh, and ceremonial buildings, and the role of the architect the role of the artist in designing cities. There's a great deal we can learn from Mexico, so it's not, the news is not all bad, it's not a horrible place, and it's a place that has great city building traditions. Um, a very famous Mexican architect once said that all Mexicans are architects and artists in their hearts. Whether it's the taxi cab driver who picks you up at the airport in Mexico City, or the gentleman behind the desk at the hotel, or the tourism guide, that Mexicans love uh, their cities, they love their traditions, their history, uh, and they use a term in Mexico that we don't see here in the United States. The term in Spanish is patrimonio cultural, cultural patrimony, the value of our heritage expressed in the way we build, the way we uh, design our buildings, the way we design our landscapes. So I, want to, I wanted to start today by making this comment that I've been researching uh, urbanism and writing about and studying architecture, city planning issues in Mexico for 30 years. And I've come away with a, a, a great respect. I'm very humbled by there's so many great architects, so many great people thinking about cities. There's a, there's a budding environmental movement in Mexico. And most of my lecture today is going to be about the challenges, the problems that Mexico faces, because they are large. But I wanted to begin there. And so I will also begin with these images, these images that speak of the great traditions of, of urbanism uh, in Mexico, from the, from the ceremonial cities, such as this one on the plateau uh, above uh, and uh, adjacent to the great um, urban center of Mexico City today to uh, the, one of the greatest gathering spaces on the planet, which is the main square of Mexico City. And this particular image, I think, is quite powerful because it's taken on the equivalent of the July 4th uh, of Mexico, which is Independence Day, which is the 16th of September, when the president of Mexico comes out in front of this building, the National Palace, and declares what's called the shout of freedom, the Grito de Dolores. And everyone on the square yells out, Viva Mexico, and Viva the great historic figures of Mexico, the great uh, figures that were part of the revolution that occurred in the 19th century. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible moment of exultation and celebration of the past and hope for the future. And it's about political participation. And it occurs in this, uh, in this beautiful uh, square, which was designed by uh, Spanish colonial engineers who thought a lot about what would make a great gathering space and a ceremonial space and uh, it's also, I think, ironic and yet important to note that this particular square is actually built over the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. So literally, they built the Spanish colonial plaza over what was an indigenous ceremonial plaza of a completely different set of ideas, a completely different religion, a completely different way of thinking and cosmology. And yet, those two spaces overlap and bring together these two traditions in Mexico. So there is, in Mexico, great respect for the past, great respect for both the pre-Columbian or indigenous past, as well as the colonial past. And those are few 
fused together today in the city building traditions of the 20th and 21st century uh, in Mexico and are still a part of how we think. So one of my questions that I've been asking myself is, and I'll you know, raise this question today, is to what extent is everything that will happen to Mexico for the rest of the 21st century, to what extent does it reflect the things that have happened in the past? Uh, because there is a great Mexican philosopher and writer called Octavio Paz, who wrote a very famous book called The Labyrinth of Solitude. Some of you may have read it. It came out back in the 70s. And one of the things that he argues in that book is about what he calls dialectics of solitude, and that he believes that Mexico and Mexicans are forever in search of meaning, the meaning of their sacred origins. They've always been, like all of us, when we come out of the womb, we spend our whole life trying to go back to our origins, in a way. And Mexicans, in a more sort of um, national sense, in a sort of national cultural sense, he believed, have always been searching for this sacred place that defined their origin. And there was a dialectic between the indigenous origins and the colonial experience and then the modern experience. But he believed that if you really want to understand Mexicans and Mexico, you have to look at the fact that Mexico is in search of its past and has this great sort of respect and awe for their origins. And so I believe that much of what we learn about Mexico and about Mexican cities and how Mexicans live in their cities and how they build and think about their cities comes from that idea of a people in search of its past, trying to recreate the greatness and understand what it meant and yet move forward in the future. All of which is, not, is to say that it's not as if Mexico is living in its past. There's great technology. Some of the best architects on the planet are Mexican, some of the best engineers. Uh, you may have read that Mexico is going to start producing uh, some very important automobiles, and they're doing other things with technology. So Mexico is not only living in the past, they're also living in the future. So all of this said, I'm now going to um, talk in the rest of my lecture about these great challenges that are facing Mexico, because there are many, many huge challenges. Um, and I think one thing that's important about Mexico that I've argued in some of my more recent work is that Mexico is, I think, a very important laboratory for understanding the future of people who live in cities across the planet. I believe that Mexico's cities, and particularly along the US-Mexico border, have many important lessons for us to learn about how we coexist when cultures come together, and this is happening all over the world. People are migrating from one place to live in another place. So we're seeing this in our own country. New York City, Miami, Los Angeles are all melting pots of culture. They're, in a sense, experiments in globalization, if you will. And Mexico City is one of those great experiments. I'm going to spend some time talking about the problems it faces from my perspective as a city planner and someone who's studied cities and architecture and city building. So one of the things that's happened in the 21st century is that when we talk about globalization, we're talking about the um, increasing global reach of trade, markets, where people work, where manufacturing investors invest. So uh, all the clothes that all of you are wearing today were probably not produced in the United States. They were probably produced somewhere else on the planet, maybe in uh, Thailand, maybe in Mexico, maybe in Hong Kong. Uh, somewhere else. So we know that the uh, flow of labor and investment, capital, advertising, it's all done globally. And we have computers and all sorts of technology that allow this globalization to occur. Well, globalization affects cities as well. And it creates massive growth and a phenomenon that uh, many of us urban scholars call the phenomenon of the megacity. So we never had megacities until the end of the 20th century. We never had cities that were more than 10 million population. But at some point in the late 20th and beginning of the 21st century, we started getting this phenomenon of this absolute explosion of cities. And the reason that's important is because for urban planners, architects, designers, we kind of knew how to manage a city of 1 million or 5 million. But when it got beyond 10 million, the scale of the size and spread of cities became so enormous that the, all the models and paradigms we had to explain life in cities and how to design them and manage them, you could throw them out the window. We needed to start creating new ideas. So we came to this term called megacities uh, with uh, populations of over 10 million. But in the same 
uh, time, we're also seeing massive cityward migration that happened in the second half of the 20th century, where in 1950 there were only 83 cities with over 1 million, and by the 2007 there were nearly 500 cities. Uh, and there's over 25 megacities on the planet today uh, growing very, very rapidly. And this map, I think, is a, a very uh, uh, important because it shows where the megacities are. So the really large orange circles, we see that China, India, Southeast Asia, and uh, Latin, Amer Latin and South America, the sort of equatorial line defines where most of the urbanization is occurring uh, in the warmer climates, the southern climates, in the so-called developing world. So people, millions and millions and millions of people are moving to megacities and creating a whole range of new questions about how we're going to manage this planet, questions about the future sustainability of life on this planet, questions about security. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of discussions of terrorism as if it just sort of suddenly appeared one day. But nobody talks about what are the conditions that are created across the planet when people are living in impoverished conditions in cities that are struggling to create jobs and struggling to have a safe environment for people to grow up in, children to grow up in, to know that they're going to be safe and be able to have a job and have a place to live. Uh, and that is a very uh, important question to ask, is what are the geographic and um, spatial conditions that create uh, the possibility that people might turn towards some other way of thinking that's not compatible with most of the planet. So what are the trends in world urbanization that affect places like Mexico is that populations are, have been booming since the second half and will continue to boom in the first half of the 21st century. As I mentioned, there's more than 500 cities uh, that will have a million population by 2020. People are still moving to, from rural areas to cities, over 100 million people a year. Uh, most wealth in the world is created in cities and produced in cities or city regions. And uh, the other thing is that cities are growing from the center outward. And this question of what's happening on the edges of the city is something that I want to talk about. It's, you know, we often use the term urban sprawl. Um, but there are really big questions about the management of urban sprawl, both in terms of the political meaning of sprawl, the cultural meaning of sprawl, the environmental implications of urban sprawl, and all of the kinds of questions about how to manage that for the future in our country as well as in Mexico. So uh, what are some of the urbanization trends within Mexico? Well, I said people are moving to cities. And first of all, Mexico is a classic example of a country that um, has a, a pattern that we often refer to as primacy, which means that only a few cities tend to dominate where most people live in the country. So if you look at Mexico City has 20% of the entire population of Mexico, Mexico City, the greater Mexico City region, that includes some other cities nearby like Toluca. And if we extend that out a little further and we include the central plateau of Mexico, the Meseta Central, and we include Guadalajara and Puebla and some of the other cities here, about a third of the nation's population lives in just a few of the major cities. So we've seen that hyper-centralization People moving to Mexico City, Guadalajara, uh, a, a city in the north called Monterrey, has been absolutely a huge part of the overall growth of the, of the country. It slowed down a little bit in the 90s. Mexico's government tried to create what it called a decentralization or deterritorialization strategy to try to create incentives for people to move away from those cities. And one of the places that people have moved to is here to the borderlands. So there's been a lot of growth of cities on the Texas border, the Arizona border, the uh, US-Mexico border in general, and of course the California border. Uh, but the phenomenon is only slightly less centralized, as I mentioned in this slide. So we're talking about a nation where millions of people have been moving to cities since the 1960s. And they've been mostly going to Mexico City, a few other cities, and then to the northern border. So if you look at the distribution of population according to Mexico's National Statistical Institute. And I should tell you, by the way, that I have, throughout my career, um, argued that the Mexican government 
routinely underestimates the size of its cities and routinely underestimates the population's figures for its cities. I remember back in the 80s when I first came out to, set to the region and I was down in Tijuana talking to um, people in the electricity business and they were telling me just based on the number of uh, electricity um, contracts that were being sold to houses and neighborhoods that they thought the population of Tijuana was already about 1.5, 1.6 million maybe getting as high as 1.8. And I went to a conference and these demographers from the Mexican government were sitting at the conference telling us that the population of Tijuana was 700,000 or 800,000. And I had just heard from people in Tijuana that it was probably double that. That's when I realized something's not quite right here. And what's the, the problem is, as you'll see when I start talking about what's going on, it's what's happening in the poorest areas of the city where people live in uh, what we call colonias very, very poor neighborhoods, sometimes referred to in the past as squatter settlements because people invade the land and move there. Well, those neighborhoods tend to be either not census at all or heavily underreported or under census. Because think about it, if you're a census taker and you see a neighborhood that is, has no electricity, the roads are dirt roads, um, the houses are makeshift, you're wondering, should I even go in there? Do I really want to uh, include this in the census? Well, it's even worse than that. Sometimes the government doesn't recognize those neighborhoods. Those folks aren't paying taxes. Their houses aren't officially, their properties haven't been officially subdivided and platted the way we do in the US or other countries. So they're not actually on the registers of the city tax rolls and planning offices. They're trying to get on the registers. And I'll tell you a story about neighborhoods where the citizens are begging the city that they want to pay taxes. And it's the city that doesn't necessarily want to embrace them in that uh, process. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But the, the point is that these numbers that I'm showing you are probably a lot higher, uh, maybe 20% higher. We don't know, because there's a lot of uncertainty about how censuses are done and whether the counting is completely accurate. So we do know that Mexico City is a huge monster of a city, population-wise. Um, it's, a, you know, it's one of the largest cities on the planet, the region, the metropolitan area. We know that there are a number of other very large cities that have grown, but this drop from 20 million to 4 million is a very huge drop. Uh, in the urban planning field, we talk about urban systems, systems of cities that represent, or hierarchies that represent where all the population of a country lives. And we usually have argued in the past that it's sort of more efficient to have cities distributed uh, throughout the country, not just have one massive, huge city and then a bunch of small and medium-sized cities. So, for example, in the United States, you have New York, L.A., Chicago, Philadelphia. You've got a number of cities that are New York and uh, L.A., probably the metropolitan areas are somewhere between 10 and 15 million, depending on how you define them, maybe 10 to 12 million. Then you have places like Chicago, Philadelphia that are uh, less than that, maybe 7 million, 6 million. So we have more sort of medium, large size cities across the country, uh, and not just one big city and a bunch of smaller cities. So countries that tend to have this type of a distribution, it's seen as being a political economic snapshot of over-centralization in the political system. And that's one of the things that scholars will tell you about Mexico, is that it's a highly centralized nation politically. A lot of the political power has always lied in the federal capital in Mexico City the center of government, also most of the important banks and industries and all of the major assets of the country are all concentrated in one place. That's kind of a dangerous idea, especially in a place that's prone to earthquakes, to have the entire wealth of your nation concentrated in one place. And also it has, as you'll see, very, very powerful environmental and urban planning implications for those of us who are concerned with those kinds of issues. So let's talk about Mexico City, if I might. So as I mentioned, Mexico City is one of the uh, largest metropolitan areas on the planet. Uh, seen from the air, it doesn't look as intimidating as it might when you get closer to the ground. Uh, one of the problems of Mexico City is it's a, it's a, a, a basin in the middle of a, uh, a mountain range that um, traps the air that's created inside the basin. Uh, and it's also built on a former set of system of lakes. So when those lakes have dried up, the uh, soil under those lakes is very silt or sandy-like. 
And so if you remember the big earthquake in Mexico City in, 19, in the mid-1980s, one of the problems was it was actually an earthquake. The epicenter was off the coast. But the rumbling, the plates that moved, shifted under the earth all the way up to the central plateau. When they started to shift under Mexico City, the buildings were sitting basically on sand. And that shifting caused the buildings to be to oscillate. And you crash into each other, and it was a pretty devastating, scary earthquake that could happen anywhere in the world where you have this sort of perfect storm of conditions of uh, building a city in that way. And we do it all over the world. Mexico City is not the only place where cities are built on unstable geological formations, but it is one of the largest metropolitan areas that we've done that. Um, so building a city and having 20 million people live in this huge, massive basin that sits surrounded by mountains creates uh, a kind of, as I said, a perfect storm of difficult, challenging environmental problems. And there are three big important elements to those challenges. One is air pollution. The second one is the water crisis. And the third is the problem of land and human development. So um, Mexico City on a bad smog day looks something like this. I actually took this photograph. It's a little uh, unclear. Um, it's a, an old slide that I had that I took back in the 80s. Uh, from the uh, Torre Latinoamericana, if you've ever been up in that tower, looking back toward um, Polanco and the southern uh, part of the city. Uh, and you, what, when you see this, this level of smog, it reminds you of Los Angeles, right? So we have to, first thing we have to do is, is don't begin to think, oh, God, those Mexicans, they got this smog. And just remember that we. Uh, probably the word smog was invented in the United States. So if we're going to talk about air pollution, we are the kings of air pollution. We have some of the worst air pollution on the planet. So it's, 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 it's bad in Los Angeles for similar reasons. You've got westerly flows of air and mountains to the east that block the air and trap it over the LA basin in the same way that it happens in Mexico City. So geography plays a huge role, as does what you do in your city. When you build a city like Los Angeles, totally dependent on one machine, the automobile, that creates a lot of pollution. And there's nowhere for the air to push that pollution out. It gets trapped, and you keep recreating that. And then it flows south down here into San Diego. So every morning, you can watch the smog come down the coast. So let's not be too, um, too uh, settled and relaxed and say, oh, it's only down there. No, it's not only down there. It's, it's in many places. Um, the problem in Mexico City is, is exacerbated by what I said before, the geography, the fact that Mexico City is built on a lake bed, and there's enormous amounts of dust, uh, particulate dust. So that's especially problematic for young children. Their lungs are very sensitive, and when they're breathing that dust, combined with all the other toxic things and chemicals in the air uh, that occur in addition to the dust, you've got uh, unregulated industry, auto pollution, and now we, we've discovered that a lot of household stoves use gas that also contributes to air pollution. So uh, as I mentioned, the basin of Mexico City sits at 6,800 feet above sea level. So when you're at 6,800 feet above sea level, you're actually breathing less oxygen to begin with. So if you're breathing less oxygen and your lungs are working harder and the air is toxic, that's even more dangerous. Um, so as I mentioned, there are various sources of that air, including uh, unregulated or, or underregulated industry, auto fumes, dust, uh, and household uh, products and stoves. There's a lot of cars in Mexico City. There are a lot of factories in Mexico City that need to be regulated. Um, and of course, we know that sunlight uh, uh, reacts with certain chemicals in the air to create this thick, smoggy type environment. Um, and so if you're in a southern latitude where there's a lot of sun at high ele elevations with all these perfect storm of conditions, you have a first-hand public health crisis. And that's what you have had in Mexico City for the last 20 years. Uh, there are certain days in the year when the air pollution conditions are very unsafe. And you're seeing very high rates of certain types of diseases like emphysema, pneumonia, bronchitis asthma and cardiovascular diseases, uh, again, not unlike what we see in certain parts of the United States and other parts of the world. So 
Um, the, to, to their credit, Mexico understands this is a problem. There are uh, some fantastic uh, public health clinics that are studying this problem and trying to figure out things to be, that could be done to improve conditions. And uh, I'll tell you one thing that I think would be very promising for Mexico City is to get people out of their cars. I mean, this is something we're facing all over the world. Uh, Mexicans in Mexico City, I've spent a lot of time in my career in Mexico City lecturing, living some, for periods of time, working there with colleagues, and uh, people who can afford to, they want to have a car. They don't like using the transit system that they have right now. So there are places in the world, large cities, that have found alternatives, good transit. Uh, we call it bus rapid transit, or BRT. Uh, I think I mentioned somewhere in the slide that the high density city like Mexico City would benefit because it's very expensive to dig down below, and especially in a place like Mexico City, which is already geologically questionable. So when they, did the, when they built the metro in Mexico City, that was a very challenging thing that, to do in the first place. Uh, and there were concerns about disturbing the geology of the uh, metropolitan area. So a better way to go is going to be to build above surface. But of course, you have a very built out city with a lot of topographic challenges anyway. So it's not going to be an easy thing to put in these bus lines. They are starting to put in some rapid transit, above ground rapid transit. But I was, um, this I thought was a very promising, it's a, it's a new town that they built outside of Mexico City to the west called Santa Fe. And uh, the problem with Santa Fe is it's almost totally automobile dependent right now. Uh, there isn't a good mass transit system serving into this neighborhood, which is an important neighborhood. There's a lot of decentralized industry there, high tech industry. There's universities. So it's a destination that many people go to. But right now, they're mostly going there by car. And I know that because when I work there, I end up taking a taxi to get there because there's no other way to get there. Uh, easily by bus or transit. So Mexico City, like many cities on the planet, is really going to have to step up and look at how to connect these new outer lying centers with transit, get, getting people out of cars. Um, but people, like in the United States, they're very locked into the car use. In fact, there's a funny story where they created, you, some of you may have heard this, one of the policies they created was to only allow people with license plate numbers that end in odd numbers to use their cars certain days of the week. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, if you had an odd license plate number, you could use your car. The other days, if you got pulled over and you had an even number, uh, an odd number license plate on the wrong day, you'd get a ticket. So what did Mexican people do? They bought a second car with the opposite. They had an odd license plate number and an even license plate number. So the um, Mexican government quickly realized that that wasn't such a great thing. Or maybe they were switching their license plates on different days. Um, so there are these ideas out there, but it's, it's a new, it's a, it, we're on a frontier. We're, we're trying to find ways to become more sustainable, and we have to find ways to inspire us all anywhere on the planet to figure out what we can do to make the planet uh, more sustainable. So the second point here is that Mexico City, as I mentioned, uh, was built over a bed of water. In fact, if you've ever seen drawings of the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, you'll know that it was a canal city. It was built on, on this giant lake, which had a lot of water. Now, um, I don't want to get into the politics of climate change, but it does seem very clear that um, the planet is getting warmer, and giant sources of water are either disappearing or completely disappeared or being tapped out as sources of water for people living in large cities. And this is very much the case in Mexico City, where once it was a city built literally on top of a lake where there was so much water that you had to put canals on it to get from one island to the other. Today, there's no, that water is mostly gone. And to get to that water, they had to dig down very far and it cost lots of money, millions of dollars, to pump the water back up. Today, what's happening in Mexico City is they're going further and further away from the metropolitan area up into underground sources of water called aquifers that are much farther away from the center. And again, those aquifers are sunk in very deep under the earth, and they require a lot of expense to pump that water out. And there's less and less of that water. So it's sort of like a, a ticking time bomb. At what point does the city just simply run out of water? 
Uh, now, that is a point I think we can relate to here in California, because we're asking ourselves the same question. They say it's going to rain in the, in the next few days, but um, we haven't had any rainfall for like five or six years, and we are at our lowest levels in history, uh, and we are now really concerned about how we're going to sustain the quality of life, the agriculture, the fish, fishing, uh, living in cities, uh, all the vegetation that we water, some of which we probably shouldn't be watering. Uh, but those are questions that we, we will be asking in our corner of the planet. And Mexico has the same dilemma of how do you provide water for 20 million people when there's no water, there's no water left under the city. Plus, it's probably not such a good idea to be you know, drilling holes into a surface that has volcanoes nearby and is earthquake prone and has already had one global catastrophe uh, in the last 30 years. So we really have to, Mexico has to find another source of water and it's going to have to find it pretty quickly. So uh, as I mentioned, the water is 60 miles away, often is as deep beneath the surface as 3,000 feet. It costs millions and millions of dollars to pump it back to the city. And even still, lots of people don't have water because, as I mentioned, those neighborhoods that are not only covered by the census, they don't have plumbing facilities, something we take for granted in the United States. They don't have what we call piped water facilities. So they're not even getting the water that is being pumped from other sources. And they also have substandard sewage facilities. Sometimes they build their own sewage systems, and sometimes those sewage systems leak, leak into the water table and that pollutes the entire uh, substrata under the city. Uh, and as I mentioned, when you pump the water from those aquifers, it's further drying the soil and creating more air pollution. So you have this kind of um, you know, legacy of one thing affects the other. And that's the thing that you know uh, if you teach uh, courses on environmental planning to students is that one of, the, the, one of our favorite words that we use is interdependence. Everything is interdependent. So when you do one thing that you think is good, it's causing another problem that's not good. So when you begin to understand that our entire ecosystem is a highly interdependent, complicated ecosystem, we have to really start thinking about the implications of some of the things that we do that we've taken for granted for too long that have negative consequences in the long term. So, and pumping water, obviously, as I mentioned, is going to be geographically uh, geologically unstable in the sandy soils of Mexico City. Uh, on the third point here about land and human settlements, uh, as I mentioned, people have been migrating since the 60s to Mexico City. And the reason they've been migrating is because, it's a long story, but one which you probably more or less understand, that Mexico was, a, was an agrarian nation, was a rural nation, produced most of its wealth from its farms. And then in the 50s and 60s, as they began to mechanize and as capital invested in land and farming, millions and millions of Mexicans were living in subsistence agriculture. They only were producing enough food to barely get by. And even then, they weren't getting enough nutrition. They weren't consuming enough protein. They, the children weren't getting dairy products they needed. So the only way they could survive and earn enough surplus to afford medical care, to send their children to school, to live the, the quality of life that all citizens on this planet deserve was to move to cities. So they would migrate first to local towns. If they couldn't find a job in the town, then they would eventually go to the cities. And eventually, the cities of Mexico became, as has occurred all over the world, became the places that were magnets that drew people to try to find work in this new industrializing sector that was occurring all over Mexico. So people began moving to cities, but the size of the migration patterns was so enormous that there was no way the cities could provide labor markets or housing for all these millions of people. And so what people did was what anyone would do. They tried to find a way to survive. And those urban migrants are very clever folks. They figured out how to survive. And it's an incredible story that people often forget. They think about poor slums. They're, again, they're stereotyped. They're demonized. But the fact is that the neighborhoods around cities like Mexico City that people have built themselves, they put in their own plumbing. They pirated sometimes electricity. They subdivided the land themselves. They built their own roads in many cases. And then they went back to the government and said, pave our roads. We already put them in for you. Uh, we'll vote for you if you pave our roads. We'll vote for you if you put water infrastructure. I remember the president-elect uh, of Mexico came to Tijuana um, and uh, said, 
I will uh, build water facilities in Tijuana for you. You know, he was basically saying, please, please vote for me. Uh, and that's the way it works everywhere on the planet for people who are poor who move to these cities. So it's not an easy situation, but when they move into this kind of environment with very hilly topographic conditions, they build themselves, and we refer to those uh, in sort of urban planning jargon, we call those irregular, or Mexico likes to call them irregular settlements or spontaneous settlements because they're kind of built by people without putting together a kind of a general plan or a master plan and figuring out how it would all fit together uh, from an engineering and urban planning standpoint. So uh, let me you know, speed it up a little bit, but I just want to say that the, I've been talking about the fact that most people have moved to the periphery, what we call the periphery, the outs, outside of the city. And so I think we really need to, one of the reasons I wrote my new book, Global Suburbs, is because I think we really need to talk about the periphery. Okay? Um, and basically, one slice of what's going on on the periphery is that 50% um, or more people live on land where their ownership is either uncertain or they're basically illegal. They're considered sort of pirates. They've moved onto this land. They're not recognized as the owners. And uh, they're considered um, squatters. squatters, right? They're squatters. They're squatting on the land, OK? And here's a colonia in Tijuana. But given this culture of uncertainty, um, people are upset. And you'll see a lot of graffiti like this. You know, we need to you know, pay less for, for our light, our electricity. Uh, this is a, was a, a demonstration in uh, a neighborhood in Tijuana where people are concerned about the cost of services where they aren't earning enough to survive. So why is all this uncertainty there? Um, by the way, these tires are purchased in the United States by weight. They're um, tires that are being thrown away. They're being recycled, sold across the border in Mexico, and used to build terraced hillsides to stabilize the hillsides. So now we're going to be getting all this rain. And in a hilly city like Tijuana, the hills can just become mud mudslide. We have the same phenomenon in California. We're able to build more expensive terracing with stone or with uh, railroad ties. But in poor neighborhoods, they buy these recycled tires, very, very cheap by weight, and they use it to uh, stabilize the hillsides. But illegitimacy of ownership allows the landowner to basically put you in a, in a sort of um, in hiatus. You don't know if you're going to be able to stay on your land. And while the owner is deciding what to do with your land, uh, you're living there, but you don't have power over it because he or she could kick you off at any time. Um, and that's probably not the best possible arrangement. I want to say a little bit about where we live here, because here you see um, the, 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 the reality of, uh, of a, uh, a US city that bumps up against the Mexican city. Here's the border. And these two cities are incredibly different, and yet they share the same exact setting. There's mountains on both sides. The mountains don't stop at the border. The birds that fly around, they don't have a checkpoint for birds <laughs> at that border. All the land animals go back and forth. Um, and yet the people can't. We have this humanly built boundary that separates us somewhat artificially. But we share the same ecosystem. We share the water. We share the topography, the geology. If there's an earthquake, it's going to cross the border. If there's a wildfire, it's going to cross the border. So we really have a great deal in common. And yet we're so different, because that's what a suburban house looks like in Mexico. And that's what the suburbs look like in the United States. So we really have to recognize that we're fundamentally different, fundamentally different. And yet we have a lot in common. Now, this is uh, when I first came to Tijuana back in the 80s, one of my students' friend had a plane, and he took me for a ride in Mexico, and we looked at some of the new uh, colonias that were being. Now, these people laid out this neighborhood with themselves. They created the streets. They were building their houses from scratch. And it was not uh, a neighborhood at that time that was recognized by the city. But Tijuana grew from 165,000 in 1960 to uh, over 2 million now by 2010. So massive urbanization, mostly in the periphery. And here you can see the sprawl, the purple, were the first irregular settlements, and then further out and infilling into canyons wherever they could build after the, uh, the original wave. And these uh, red uh, dots show the areas that don't have good sewage, again, mostly in the colonias toward the outskirts of the city. And this is a map that I drew showing income. It's kind of the opposite of the United States. In the United States, we have the poor people live close to the center, and the rich people live in the suburbs. In Mexico, you see the lowest income 
is this, mostly in the suburbs, mostly in the periphery, and the wealthier families, the higher income, the dark areas, closer to what we call the river zone, and only along the coast is where you see, because it's near the beach, where you also have a, uh, enclaves of wealth. So Mexican cities are sort of like the opposite of how we build in the United States. And yet, here's an area, uh, this is the um, Otay Mesa, Mesa de Otay strategic plan that's being created by the city and county of San Diego and other cities along with the city of Tijuana. They're trying to come up with a strategic plan for the future growth in this area. And you can see that on the Mexican side, um, this area here is a major growth area. And this growth area is part of a recognized plan for both countries. And yet, uh, there are poor people living in that area. And those poor people's future is very much up for grabs. So uh, there was a, a British scholar who wrote a book uh, back in the 70s, uh, reprinted in the 80s, called Whose City? Who decides what the future of my city is? Is it the poor people in the neighborhoods? Is it government officials? Is it wealthy investors? Who decides? Whose city? Who does the city belong to? Do I, if I live in this house that I've been living in for 30 years, may or may not have title to my land, but I've been living there, I'm a citizen of Mexico, do I have some say in what happens to my neighborhood? And the answer is, is Maybe not. And this is a, a neighborhood, by the way, that's been studied a lot here at UCSD by uh, a colleague of mine in the Urban Studies and Planning Program with a bunch of environmental scientists who have been looking at people who lived in this neighborhood, what happened to them, this neighborhood and actually another neighborhood, uh, several neighborhoods in Tijuana are being studied environmentally in terms of urban planning and various other questions. So this is a neighborhood called Maclavio Rojas and it's located here on the edge of Tijuana. Here's downtown Tijuana. Here's the border with the US. Here's the ocean. OK. So as the city has grown toward the periphery, um, this is an area. This is the road that goes to Tecate here. So along this road, you'll see green is industry. There's a lot of industry here. Big automobile companies like Toyota and Hyundai, they build assembly plants that assemble parts of cars, which then go back for the completed car somewhere else in the United States or somewhere overseas. And right here is a neighborhood. You see also that the blue is the residential neighborhoods. There's a lot of new suburbs that are being built on the edges of Tijuana. And they're not those poor colonias now. They're middle class, working class, suburban type, US type suburbs. So you have something very interesting happening here. There's a confluence of interests. There's global investors who want to build housing that they can market to middle class people who they think will be able to afford these very tiny suburban-like houses. There's manufacturing interests who are part of globalization, who want to see the city grow and expand and be part of the global economy. And then there's poor people who already live there who want to just live where they're living. So this is a community, Maclavio Rojas. This is their neighborhood. They built it in 1988. They thought that they'd actually bought the land from what's called an ejido, which used to be a rural cooperative that was created by the government after the Mexican Revolution. And many of those ejidos have now been incorporated into cities. So they thought they had documents that showed that they bought the land from an ejido. But now their uh, government's questioning whether those documents are legitimate or not. It wasn't, didn't cost that much back when they bought it because it was far away from everything. No one wanted it. Remember I said, people get land that nobody else wants. So they took it upon themselves to build their own school and a community meeting place and water infrastructure. They put in their own meters. And they told the government, we're willing to pay for our water. We want to pay taxes. We want to be part of the city. They built their own school. We want our teachers to be licensed and recognized by the state of Baja. But the Mexican government said, not so fast. I know you've been living there since 1988, but uh, this is kind of valuable land here. We're not sure what we want to happen here. And a lot of companies were coming along and saying that they wanted to build factories, like the Toyota plant 10 miles down the road. Hyundai has container storage there. They might want to use it for something else. And all of a sudden, you have this new phenomenon about global suburbs where investors are coming in and say, wow, there's a huge market. Two million people live in Tijuana, and not all of them are poor. Some of them actually have money. They might want to buy a suburban house, maybe not as big as the one in San Diego, maybe a small scaled down version. Maybe we can create these huge global suburban communities. So here's the neighborhood of Maclavio Rojas. As I mentioned, here's the highway to Tecate. Here are all the maquilas, or assembly plants. So the government literally swooped in in the 1990s, 
Um, they declassified the school, which they had told the people in the neighborhood before that they were going to recognize. They are actually arrested community leaders. Several women were thrown into prison. And they halted the whole plan to improve the water system. They actually threw some of the people in prison because they said they were stealing water. People were like, we're not stealing the water. We built it, and we told you we're building it. And we asked you to come in and put meters so we could pay you for the water. We're not stealing it. They didn't agree. The government didn't agree. So it's a problem. In, in 2005, a, a woman filmmaker came to Tijuana and filmed a, an award-winning film called Everyone Their Grain of Sand. If you can get your hands on this, it's a wonderful documentary about the people of Maclavio Rojas and how they tried to create a community, work with the Mexican government, plead with the Mexican government to please recognize them as a regular neighborhood. And uh, in the end, people ended up going into hiding or some were jailed. And they're still petitioning the government to allow them to be part of the city of Tijuana. So this is a, a story of Mexico's struggle to try to balance the economic uh, interests of globalization against the, the community and human rights needs of people who actually live in these neighborhoods. Um, and one of the good things about Tijuana is it is close to the United States, close to Southern California. There's a lot of global media attention. The, the story has been reported widely in the press since this occurred in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, there's social media now, so there's a lot more attention to these issues. So it's harder for the Mexican government, going to be more difficult for the Mexican government to not recognize the human rights needs of people. So, and I'll end finally just by saying that these are, th this is a photograph, an actual photograph of one of the new suburbs in Tijuana that is, as you can see, very tightly woven homes for uh, the poor and working class people. Um, and uh, the next time I lecture, I'll tell you more about these global suburbs, but just quickly, uh, they're being built by a Mexican government agency called Infonavit, which used to be a home building agency. Now it finances houses. It hires big developers. They put in these giant neighborhoods, um, and there's a lot of problems. There's no schools, no hospitals, no transit connection, no shopping. Uh, and right now in Mexico, there, it's a crisis. About 33% of all the global suburbs that have been built are abandoned. Another large percentage of them, there's a crime occurring, there's, people don't want to live there, it's not working. So they have to rethink this whole idea of just letting private developers come in, build US style suburbs in the middle of nowhere, and people, they're not sustainable, so it's not working. Uh, just very quickly, how could you fix the colonial problem? I won't go through all of this stuff, but I will say that NAFTA could institutionalize funding for these in low income neighborhoods by us, Americans. We could, a very small percentage of all our companies who invest in Mexico could pay a tax, a small tax, that would raise millions and millions of dollars that could help these squatter communities regularize and, and improve their quality of life. Um, there's great promise in Mexico for this, uh, as I said, bus rapid transit. This is a photograph of the Transmilenio in Bogota, Colombia. There's also an incredible BRT systems being built in, in Brazil, in Curitiba and Rio. They're low cost. They're very efficient, they're fast, people like them. They come every few minutes. You can get in and out, they're like subways, but they're buses. You see they have the raised platform. So what happens is when the bus comes in, the doors open electronically, you get on quickly, they shut, and it go keeps going. It's a dedicated lane, you see it's separated from the cars, so it can go very quickly. It's a, it, it is the future of transit on our planet, folks. And we need it in San Diego, but it's gonna work really well in Mexico because it works well in high density cities. Um, this is something that I think is a success story. Downtown redevelopment. Mexico has beautiful historic colonial downtowns. If they want to be more sustainable, they need to get their population to move back toward the center of the city rather than away from the center. It's much more sustainable. You don't have to spend a lot of money moving people around. You can have jobs in the center. You can have um, some light industry, high tech companies. They did a redevelopment project in the center of Mexico City. They opened up a street that used to be a, a car-oriented street. They've turned it into a pedestrianization project. It's wor working really well. Uh, and they are also starting these natural eco buses. I think this is a great uh, thing in Mexico. But we need smart growth on the periphery. They tried. We, we in the United States you know, sold the model of dumb growth. Our, a lot of our suburbs are not smart. They're car oriented, they're isolated, they're, you can't get in there with transit. So we're rethinking that model now. We have this thing called the new urbanism and we're trying to be smarter about how we build suburbs. And Mexico, that's something that Mexico should copy from us. Not our bad suburbs, but our good new, uh, new uh, models that we're creating in the United States. And finally, this is 
a wonderful uh, project that I found in Brazil where people are building little models of their favelas and then putting them in art museums to show that it can be beautiful as well and to try to build this idea that we're not bad because we live in a poor neighborhood. A favela doesn't have to be bad. And it really pushes the idea also of cooperation, community participation. People will improve their communities if they, if they feel they own their land and if, they're, if they have ownership culturally of the whole narrative of living in these neighborhoods. So this project is a wonderful project that's being, um, that's, uh, the, the, the children are the artists that create with bricks and cardboard boxes and pieces of wood that they paint uh, a facsimile of what their neighborhood actually looks like because they're often built on these hillsides. Then they, actually this one was built in a favela. They also have moved some of them into museums. Uh, and it's really a great idea to uplift the, uh, the psyche of people living in these neighborhoods so they don't feel guilty and bad that they live in a poor neighborhood. And I think this is a great model. I think the model of Habitat, which was created by former President Carter, is a great model, and other NGOs that we should take as Americans. We should care about the Mexican border. Uh, we should try to invest in that because it comes back to us. You know, a lot of our factories in Mexicali are dumping pollution into the New River. Guess where the New River flows? back into the United States. So you know that fruit that you buy in the supermarket that's grown in the Imperial Valley? Guess whose water might be polluting the fruit that we're consuming? Ours. It's our companies that relocated to Mexicali to not, be, to not have to follow environmental restrictions in California. So they built their factory in Mexicali. They're assembling furniture, painting it with toxic things. Now they dump the water in the, in the river the river flows across the border into the United States and it gets into the ecosystem on the US side. Now we're trying to address that in the United States. We're very aware of that. Our state is aware of it. Our Federal Environmental Protection Agency, I've been out to meetings out in that area. But you know that water eventually flows to the Salton Sea, which is another resource that's in trouble. So this is my point and I'll end here. We are, the world is interdependent now. You can't separate one nation from another. You can't separate the problems of Mexico from the problems of the United States. We share the environment. We share labor markets. We share economies. We share all sorts of good things, and we share some bad things, too, that I haven't talked about today. But I know there have been other lectures about those, those phenomena. So we share. We are neighbors. And when you have a neighbor, you know, you can try to build a fence and ignore them, but um, you know, Robert Frost said good fences make good neighbors. So we need to maybe, you know, lower the lower the fence and you know, go back to 9/11. Created this fence again. Now I think we started to pull back and realize that Mexico is our neighbors. We we have to embrace them. They are part of our our culture. They live here. We we share our our, our lives with millions of people of Mexican heritage. And so our future is really intertwined, and I'm going to uh, end on that note. We're intertwined, and our cities, or even our cities, are intertwined. Thank you very much. Thank you.